Good afternoon again. My name is Lily Lopez McGee, and I am the manager for the Diversity Network. And I am excited to be here with um, Katya Kurtz from Cultural Vistas and Ahaji um, from Drexel University. And today our experts will be discussing um, barrier, overcoming the barriers to sending STEM students abroad, that is science, technology, engineering, and math majors um, on education abroad programming. I will let the ladies introduce themselves, but before we hop on, I did want to just um, remind everybody that we have the dashboard to the right of your screen where you'll be able to ask questions at any point during the presentation. We will also be making this recording available to you and your colleagues at a, after the, the webinar has concluded, and we will be sure to distribute that widely. So happy International Education Week. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, I will go ahead and uh, let uh, Katya and Ahaji uh, get us started. Okay, great. I guess I'll start. So uh, my name is Haji Schreffler, and I am the Associate Director for Undergraduate Program Development in the Drexel University Study Abroad Office. I've been with Drexel for almost 11 years, and my primary role in the study abroad office now is to work with faculty and with our partners abroad to actually create new undergraduate programming. Um, so I spend a large majority of my time working with faculty on faculty-led programs and um, identifying best suited exchanges and other models abroad so that we can increase our study abroad participation. Hi, and my name is Katja Kurz. I'm University Relations Officer at Cultural Vistas, which is a nonprofit organization in international education, um, providing internship and professional programs for students and young professionals um, worldwide. And my role is to work with universities and colleges in the United States to mobilize more STEM students and underrepresented students in international education um, to make sure that we can get um, these student groups abroad as well. And I'm happy to be here today. Excellent. So I think the best place to start is really just taking a look at what the STEM participation is in international education. And the IIE recently published uh, the numbers from 2012-13. So if we take a look at the last four years with STEM majors um, in the blue, we can see that there really hasn't been substantial growth. There has been some increase in STEM participation and study abroad, but not substantially. So we do have a lot of work to do in this area, but the good news is that there are definitely things that we can do about it and strategies that we can implement to hopefully um, increase the results in the future. It's also important to consider who is going abroad, and these statistics are, are are definitely not um, a secret. I think anyone that works in the field has uh, become familiar with the fact that the large majority of students studying abroad are non-minority students, white students. So if we look the the participation in the U.S. of study abroad students, 24% of minorities, while minorities make up 39% of college students and 59% of Gilman recipients. So minority students have a higher need as, as represented by the Gilman numbers, but also are the lower lower percentage of study abroad participations. So that's something that we always want to keep in mind as we're looking at ways to increase access and um, programming for a diverse group of students. So the question is that why don't more STEM students study abroad? And when it comes to the barriers, some of them are perceived barriers and some of them are real issues that we can address in strategic ways. So issues such as time and curriculum not fitting into their schedule. We know that STEM students have much more uh, lockstep curriculum than other disciplines. Money is probably the most common concern across all study abroad or students looking into study abroad, the affordability aspect. Not only affordability, but also opportunity costs. Looking at the job market, STEM students often believe that because they can earn more working in the U.S., well, why would they take the time away to go to another country? And honestly, do employers even care? There's a large perception that employers don't actually care about these international experiences. And that influences the value that STEM students have on study abroad. A lot of times they look at it as kind of a plan B or C if they don't get the internship that they want or the research opportunity. Then if all else fails, I guess I'll study abroad. 
And lastly is language. We know that STEM students have a harder time fitting other languages into their curriculum. And they often think that because they can't fit those languages in, and they only speak English, that that means they can't study abroad. And there are a lot of faculty perceptions as well. We say perceptions because uh, these issues tend to be things that can absolutely be addressed and that are not always um, accurate and true. So faculty values, you know, we've heard at Drexel at least pretty often faculty saying that, well, why would a student want to study another institution when we have the best faculty here? Um, or that students are not going to be able to study curriculum, uh, courses in their curriculum by going abroad because those opportunities are really for students in humanities. And then the job market, that working in the U.S. is going to earn them more money and experience. The, the most frustrating thing is to have students who are actually interested in international opportunities to be dissuaded because their faculty are not on board. And we've actually seen that pretty often at Drexel where interested students have been completely turned off to study abroad because because of the advice from their faculty. So these perceptions, while they may not be real, um, are definitely issues that we need to address. Talking a lot about employability and employers, which STEM students are definitely more career oriented and focused than we see in other disciplines. But if we take a look at what employers are actually looking for, the perceptions don't really match up with reality. So this research was done by Ernst & Young asking employers, has the need for more globally mobile employees grown over the past three years? And do you think it's going to continue to grow over the next two to three years? And by and large, as you can see, over the past three years, almost or over 60% of employers said that it has either grown moderately or significantly and that it, over the next two to three years, 72% of employers said, yes, it's going to continue to grow, um, increase moderately or significantly. So the demand is there. The increasing demand will, in, in, demand will increase over time, and there is room for growth, especially if we look at the type of employment that STEM students are going to be uh, working in in the future, tackling global challenges and topics, some of the most pressing that, that we have to deal with, like clean water and energy and cybersecurity, environmental issues. These are all issues that STEM students, if they have these global experiences, will not only be better prepared to work in an employment, a mobile employment situation, but to also tackle some of these global challenges. And this is really just echoing what employers want. So the ability to tackle these global challenges requires the ability to work effectively in an international team, even if you're working in the U.S. in an international team, either virtually or domestically, and having the leadership development with cult cult cross-cultural understanding, using technology and knowing how advancements are going to be shaped by cultural values, and also how to solve problems that actually impact many different countries, cross-border solutions for cross-border challenges. So then, uh, and one example, of course, um, a recent um, example has been Ebola, how to combat Ebola, um, which is a challenge that we obviously are all affected by. Um, but why should, we, why should we care about this? And um, this data is taken from the um, NSF a recent report on science and engineering indicators from 2014, um, which really shows how um, bachelor's degrees in natural sciences have gone up in, in a global comparison. And as you can see, China has invested heavily um, in um, their students getting bachelor's degrees in natural sciences, so first university degrees in the natural sciences, um, whereas the US has not um, significantly increased. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that when it comes to engineering, that's even um, <laughs> It's even more stagnant here. So um, China has really grown, ha has experienced tremendous growth um, of engineering degrees, um, but the US has stayed basically the same. And when we then look at how, um, how when it comes to science and engineering occupa occupations, how does it look like for women and underrepresented minorities? And as you can see, um, both groups are very low, very uh, lowly represented in in all of these across all of the fields. Um, so we have the highest number of women in social sciences, um, but we have the lowest number in um, in engineering, both for women and and minorities, um, as well as computer and mathematical sciences and physics. So you can see there's definitely a need to diversify the the workforce in these areas as well. And just to share a little bit more of more data, how this uh, lack of of 
young talent in, in the sciences, um, how this affects us globally as well. Um, when we take a look at how this how um, this has developed globally in the pa in the past few years, we can see that um, the S accounted for only 30% um, of global our research and development. So it has gone down from um, from 2001 by 77 um, points. Um, and when we can see how um, that developing countries um, have really caught up to to the trend and really um, really created a lot of impact there, which also uh, create impact for the economy. So we can really see that the first university degrees in sciences and engineering um, are tied to, to economic impact as well. Um, and again, to compare the S um, awarding bachelor's degrees in science and engineering, um, that has gone, that's 33% um, compared to 60% in Japan and 50% in China. And when you go to the next slide, so we can change it together. And um, when you are asking who we is, um, that is all of us. So um, ranging from faculty to pro program providers to educators, funders, um, networks and consortiums, partners like Diversity Abroad, as well as employers. So we're all part of this equation um, to, to really change the landscape of STEM and mobilizing more, more STEM students to go abroad and then becoming a um, strong workforce here in the US and, and worldwide. So one of the things, uh, one of the things that's definitely not a perceived challenge, but a real challenge, is curriculum with STEM um, disciplines because the nature of the curriculum, as we know, is more lockstep and, sequ and sequenced. And so students, rightfully so, are often very concerned about falling behind or falling off track. So in terms of fixing the curriculum or addressing the curriculum in ways that will provide solutions and, and get more of our STEM students overseas, the first place to start really is to identify the trends of what's already working and who's already going at your institution. So what types of programs are successful, which which programs are not successful and why, trying to do some digging into the reasons behind what's working, what's not, and who's going. Are there certain disciplines that are not at all engaged versus others that are very active? Those types of information can really help to then step two, cast a wider net of offering a wider variety of programs to meet diverse needs. Even within STEM, we have many different needs and many different disciplines. So we want to make sure that we're offering a good range of not only program types, but program duration, program location. Um, students have a wide range of comfort level in terms of you know, many different factors. So to think that one size is going to fit all, um, which is where Drexel used to be several years ago, is just not the case anymore. Looking at how we can bring interdisciplinary collaborations in between departments or colleges is one way, as well as looking at ways to bring graduate students and undergraduate students together. All of these things can create a variety of options and tap into a, lar a larger audience of students. Another important part is to help STEM students clear their academic pathway. Our approach in the past used to be very much hands-off when it came to helping our students figure out how their academics were going to work with study abroad. And what we've realized is that with STEM students, we have to do a lot more hand-holding and really lay things out clearly in a way that reduces their um, barriers and their complications as much as possible. So we spend a lot more time laying things out academically, getting courses approved, contacting the departments, and making sure things are as clear as possible and that alternate options exist for them in, in as many ways as we can. And then one thing that we've been relentless on um, is helping our students by providing curriculum maps that include education abroad or study abroad into their actual plan of study. So the visual we have here is a plan of study that students receive in their freshman year handbook and you can see circle there is a term that has been designated as their study abroad term. So what this means is from the moment the student starts at Drexel and looks at their plan of study, study abroad has already been mapped out. Any adjustments in the curriculum have already been made. They know exactly when they need to go, what courses, how those credits will factor in, and so forth. So there's no guessing. There's no concern of how or when or will this work. All of the work has already been done for them, and this is their roadmap, and it makes it so much easier. So we have been one department at a time, um, and we haven't come close to even reaching anywhere near all departments doing this, but the ones who have, the impact that that has on students' ability and initiative of taking advantage of it has been tremendous. And then the last point is 
coming up with ways that actually acknowledge and incentivize what students are doing, the ones that actually take the time and initiative and go th and, and overcome the obstacles and do something international, how are we recognizing that? So we've recently implemented a global certificate um, program at Drexel that's been approved at the faculty senate level and the registrar that will be um, actually listed on the student's transcript that they've received the certificate. One of the aspects of that certificate requirements is that they must do something global. So it's just another incentive for the right student that would be the, the cherry on the top to, um, to convince them to pursue this opportunity. And all hands on deck, absolutely needed. Um, when it comes to shifting the culture around STEM and education abroad. This is not something that one person alone can do. Um, as Katya mentioned, it's, it really involves many different players, many stakeholders, and a lot of collaboration. So the way that I look at it is really a multi-tiered process with multi-tiered outcomes. And the question is, where does your institution fall? What are the challenges? Um, what are the gaps or the, the, the missing pieces in these outcomes? And and um, what are the highest priorities? So for example, the outcomes, I'd like to start with the end in mind. The outcomes could be getting more institutional support and funding, a tier one, that's kind of a top level outcome, or having the university actually incorporate global into the strategic plan. Then you have kind of tier two or level two outcomes, which could be collaborating within different departments, getting faculty input, designing programs, and then the third level is how are these programs actually being implemented? Um, how are they being promoted? How are students being supported? So thinking about where is the best place to start? Where is the highest need in these outcomes? What's missing? And then working backwards to see what, who are the stakeholders and the other constituents on campus that can be instrumental in helping to, uh, to produce these outcomes. So whether it is working at the top level, director level, um, with the provost, dean's council, institutional advancement, all the way down to cross-training with academic advisors, with the co-op office, financial aid, etc., with student life, engaging student organizations. All of these pieces are important. Unfortunately, they can't all be tackled at once. It really requires a strategy and inv involves a lot of people. So in our office, what we really do is look to see what role we each play in these various levels and how, who are we going to work with to create some successes almost where it's easiest? You know, what is the path of least resistance to create those successes, even at a small scale, because that will help to strengthen support across the university and to build momentum to then take it up a level, to, to um, seek more funding, et cetera. Creating strong partnerships is, is absolutely a part of that and this really involves not just campus but looking outwardly to exchange partners, providers, etc. One of the things at Drexel that we've been involved with for many years is the Global Engineering Education Exchange Consortium. This is a great way to diversify options for STEM students without taxing the university. So we automatically have opened up to 22 additional country locations for our STEM students without having to individually manage 22 different programs. Maximizing exchange programs for us has been another critical piece in getting more STEM students abroad. We really believe strongly in exchange programs because we're not only sending our students out, but we're bringing in exchange students. So that could mean customized programs, um, intensive courses, summer school, research. All of these things will not only help our students get abroad, but also increase the number of students that our partners can send to us, as well as providers. With STEM in particular, we have realized that where we may not need a provider in one location for other disciplines, we do need a provider in that same location because of the unique nature of the curriculum, as well as dual degrees and research. There's a lot of different ways that partnerships can um, translate into increased global mobility for students. I'd like to point out one, one of our programs that's been successful here, which is highlighted on the right, is an exchange agreement that we have, or exchange partnership that we have uh, with Ruhr University in Bochum, we were having some challenges on getting students to this uh, to this university. So we created a hybrid program with uh, Ruhr University, whereby we sent chemical and mechanical engineering students. They are teaching out of the five courses the students take. They are teaching four of them, 
one of the courses is being taught by a Drexel faculty. And the courses fit exactly into the Drexel student plan, study plan. In exchange for this customized program, Roar is then able to send us students during our spring quarter. So there's no cost, there's no money exchange whatsoever. We have been sending cohorts of anywhere from 15 to 20 students each year, and then they in exchange are able to send us more students. Faculty buy-in is absolutely uh, essential with everything that we've spoken to up to this point. In some cases, I, I feel like it's almost can be the most important piece because the faculty are the front line in terms of interfacing with students oftentimes. So I look at this in a twofold way. Number one, we have to increase awareness across campus in a consistent and um, ongoing way. So that could be providing workshops on specialized topics relating to global education, speaking at faculty departmental meetings, new, the new faculty resource fair, not just once though, it really takes an ongoing and consistent effort to outreach and to continue that awareness. Um, and involving faculty as much as possible. Faculty who are already cheerleading education abroad, you want their voice to be heard as loudly as possible. At the same time, increasing faculty involvement by actually getting faculty abroad with our students. So we, I'll speak myself, I, I actually myself as part of my role, I will make cold calls. I will call and target specific priority disciplines where we haven't um, had a lot of engagement and I will reach out to them almost relentlessly if, if needed um, to make inroads and say, listen, we are, this is a, a priority of the university, it's a priority of your college, and we, we'd like to reach out to you and see who in your department would be interested in developing a faculty-led program. So we are very targeted in outreaching to um, underrepresented disciplines. And there's also seed funding available for strategic locations. So money always makes the road a little easier when there's funding available. And just to give you an example of the, the impact that this has had, we started this initiative uh, just a few years ago. In 2011, we had five faculty-led intensive courses uh, for the entire year, and last academic year we had 25. So in a very short period of time, we've been able to dramatically increase the number of faculty that are going abroad, and as a result, these faculty are completely supportive and, and oftentimes become better cheerleaders than we could possibly be for their students to go abroad. Overcoming monolingualism. So one of those perceptions that the students often have is that, well, they only speak English, so they can't possibly study abroad. And that's definitely not the case. At Drexel, we believe strongly that language should be incorporated into all programs when possible. Um, so we institute a language requirement for every program that we offer the language, even if the courses are taught in English. One of the ways that we attract students to these programs is by using our um, student information system to send very targeted emails. So every term we pull class lists of every student who's in a language class, and we will reach out to the STEM students and say, hey, I, I noticed that you're taking French this term. We have this program in France that's a great fit for your major. Would you like to come in and talk about it? as well as um, making sure that on the other end that we are getting part, uh, input from your partners. There are certain courses and certain faculty at our partner schools that are more exchange student friendly than others. So we like to make sure we know in advance from our partners what type of supports are in place for students who are not taking courses in English, who are taking courses in the host language, um, which faculty are going to be most supportive, which courses are most conducive for someone who is not a native speaker. So all of these pieces have definitely paid off. And, uh, the, the data that we have here shows since uh, 2009, of our engineering students, all, almost 40% of them that studied abroad were on a program that had a language component, either a high prerequisite or on-site on language course requirement while only 20% of them were on term-long programs in English, only, only English without the language component. So we also like to talk about the ones who sometimes are left out, at least in terms of, well, I'll speak at Drexel in, in study abroad. Um, when we really started doing outreach to our STEM disciplines, we realized that 
STEM disciplines, the traditional ones, spread across four different colleges at Drexel. And we were doing very consistent and persistent outreach to all of those colleges. But for some reason, we had never included our health-related, our medical-related disciplines. So the very first thing we decided to do was be very strategic in the same type of outreach and strategy that we were using for the other STEM-related fields, we wanted to include our medical and health disciplines. What we found is that health and medical-related um, majors, service learning is very common. There are many different, uh, there's a lot of global activity happening on campus for students to do service learning, but there was nothing else happening, no academic, no research. We also found that uh, medical and health students have pretty much the same type of barriers as traditional STEM students do, with the exception of MCAT considerations and clinical courses. So in considering how can we get more of our nursing, our health professions, our medical students abroad, these were special and unique um, considerations that we had to factor into our planning. So to give you an idea of, of what type of progress this has meant for us, prior to 2009, we had not a single medical or health related student on an academic study abroad program where they were earning credit. We launched our first program in 2009 and then to date, we've had a total of 207 um, health or medical related students on either a term long program or clinical intensives. So for this, for, for us, this has been a huge, um, we haven't scratched the surface, but it's been a huge success and it just shows the importance of really not forgetting about those disciplines that are not traditionally included when we think about STEM. Technology is also, as you know, STEM students probably more than anyone are, are um, savvy when it comes to using technology. And we have used technology in a way to create more interest and more engagement on a global level uh, by something that we call global classrooms. And what this is, is working with one of our partners, we develop courses, existing courses that are then implemented with a cultural and educational exchange through assignments and projects that actually mimic real world collaboration. So the students are partnered or put into groups with students at another university, one of our partner universities, and together those two faculty develop projects where the students are actually working together virtually um, to produce their outcomes, their, their projects. And we found this has been hugely successful and what we found is that not only is it deepening the partnerships that we have abroad, but our faculty, even those who may not be the huge, the biggest um, advocates of study abroad are suddenly really interested and really supportive. So it's invigorating our faculty, it's getting them more interested in taking this to another level and it's getting our students more interested in having an actual travel um, experience related to their global classroom. We do provide incentives for this. Oops, sorry. We do provide incentives. Faculty are given $1,000 in addition to training and funding for travel. So we've had 20 global classrooms run since fall of 2013, and you can see some of the courses there that have run. Two of these courses have actually included a travel component. And co-op um, is something that you know, many universities don't have uh, the same type of co-op structure as Drexel, and we do realize that. But at Drexel, co-op is a mandatory part of all of our students' degree. And for STEM students, this is often uh, one of the reasons that they do not study abroad. So we recognize the importance of not just focusing on academic global experiences, but making sure students have many opportunities to work abroad. Um, so we offer a lot of different resources, in including study plus co-op opportunities and funding. Not being paid for six months as opposed to staying in the US and making a pretty great salary is a hard, is a hard sell. So we do provide funding for unpaid international co-op positions. And uh, when we when we talk about opportunities to mobilize STEM students, there are various models. Um, as Sahaji has alluded to, co-op is definitely a very strong one. Um, from the perspective of a provider organization, we there are a few models that we have worked with um, in the past um, and present, and we found that there are varying models um, that have worked really well for for STEM students. We 
they, and they range from group model, meaning that a small or larger group of students is going abroad at the same time together, then uh, split up to do different internships in different fields, um, to individual models where um, it's one STEM student going abroad and um, doing her or his um, internship in, independently um, from other participants that might be others in the same area or city. Um, but it's basically a one one person um, exchange program. We, we found that, and then custom programs that we um, have developed with colleges and universities to to accommodate their curricula um, in STEM. Uh, so, and we found that um, then especially the group models are really attractive to students who have not yet um, gone abroad um, before. So the kind of breaking the ice to international education, getting them exposed, getting them interested. Um, whereas the individual model is more for um, for students who are really looking forward to building their their resume and building their career, um, their their profile, their professional profile by doing an internship abroad. So really, the choice whether. Um, Choosing between an internship in the U.S. and an internship abroad, um, so we are we are we're pursuing all of these um, these different models at the same time. And when you when we look at the next slide, um, one model that um, has worked really well and we've we've um, been involved uh, with um, for over 60 years is AES Day. It's a it's a global technical um, technical exchange program for uh, students in the sciences, uh, engineering, and applied arts to do technical. Um, complete technical internships um, in their field. And the network is over 80 countries, so it's a consortium based model. So we there are 80, over 80 member countries that we uh, we exchange um, interns with. Um, and they are, the nice thing is that, all, that they are all paid positions. So whatever country a student will apply for, for um, her or his internship, um, the position will be, will be paid and will be a living wage. So guaranteeing that they can cover living expenses and, um, and can take care of their time abroad. And just to um, introduce you a little bit more to that model, um, it basically it's a consortium-based exchange. So um, so countries can trade positions between uh, them one another. So we the U.S. Um, exchanges or trades internship positions um, with countries ranging from Australia to um, Argentina to Brazil uh, to India to uh, Hong Kong, Macau, um, and um, then students can, from any university in any college can apply for, for the program uh, and, and see those internship positions and apply for those internships. So that's a, that's a great way to, to convince especially students who are reluctant to go abroad, um, who might not be uh, convinced to do a study abroad, um, really focusing on internship and doing a professional experience abroad and being paid for it, be, being paid for doing that. That is usually a great, a great uh, way to get them engaged and get them thinking. One program that we've developed, um, and a very different model, so a kind of a smaller group model, um, is for first-generation college students and for students who haven't yet had the chance to go abroad yet, whether to study abroad or internship or volunteering. Um, and that was one program that we, we are funding um, as an organization ourselves by board designated funds. And we are sending a group of 12 students per year to um, either Argentina, India, or Germany and in smaller groups. So four students each will go to these locations, complete an internship in their fields, um, and um, have a cultural immersion program as well. It's a summer program, which is really attractive because most students, uh, it allows a bit more time in their curriculum. Um, and like Haji said earlier, to STEM students are very savvy with technology, so we have a virtual collaboration that we have built into the program, which will which discusses STEM and, in this case, entrepreneurship and innovation in these three countries, um, and which gives them opportunities, since they all come from different universities all across the U.S., uh, to get to know each other, get to know um, more about the country, exchange, prepare for the time going abroad, and we, f we found that this has worked really well. One component that we also added onto this program um, is a service learning component. So after they've completed the program and they return to their campuses, they are conducting an, an, a service learning pro a program on their campus. So um, the idea is that they share in a creative way um, their experiences abroad with other students and getting really sharing the experience and getting others also interested in going abroad and showing them that it was worth it and what they've gained from this. Um, and we felt that we found that this is a really great way to multiply their knowledge on campus and um, students usually listen to other students who've gone. So um, this has been, this has worked really well as a model and we'd like to expand it um, more in the future. Another, a third model I would like to share with you today is, um, is a study, is a specialized study tour program that we've developed 
with uh, Spelman and Morehouse Colleges in Atlanta to HBCUs, um, historically black colleges and universities. And this program was um, designed to to get STEM students from HBCUs uh, abroad to Germany for two weeks in the summer for a study tour um, with two of their faculty leaders from, from the colleges, um, get them visit different STEM, STEM um, faculty research um, positions, visit different companies um, in, in Germany in the sciences and to really show them the global impact of, of, of the sciences, the global um, career pathways that are, that, are, um, that are open to them and the educational pathways as well. So really getting them abroad, breaking the ice, um, also take mobilizing the faculty and getting faculty who hadn't had um, a chance to go abroad yet to getting them abroad and really get them excited about, um, about in this case, Germany and opportunities in Germany for their students and for, for faculty as well. So we've done that in the second year. Next year is uh, going on a third. And um, the first year is a study tour that, that students and faculty participate in. And then to build on that, um, we wanted to mobilize the students who had gone to Germany um, and take them a step further to um, place them in a summer internship um, after coming back from the first year. So then the, in the second year, they, would, they could apply, qualified students could apply for a summer internship component and return to Germany in a second summer to do an internship in, with a company or in, in research institutions in their field. Um, and we found that this has worked really well. And this program, which I forgot to mention, is um, funded by um, a private foundation, the Halle Foundation, which is a German-American foundation based in Atlanta. Um, so this was a way of engaging a local funder to mobilize local STEM students from HBCUs in Atlanta to go to Germany. The, just to explain a model, um, it's based on a faculty-led uh, study tour model. So it starts um, with, student, with recruitment of students and faculty on, on the campuses. Um, then there's a four-week virtual seminar that we, we host um, together with, with external speakers about STEM in Germany and STEM fields, um, STEM research topics, um, sustainability. Um, as well as getting students to think about their own careers, how can they internationalize their, their curriculum, how can they um, become, um, how can they also bring impact into their community, so what can they do, what, what is the purpose of them, what is their, what is their passion in STEM, what do they want to achieve with it eventually. Um, then there's, there was a, a pre-departure workshop, the study tour of two weeks in Germany, um, a re-entry web webinar to recap the, the results, impressions, and the next steps to apply for programs um, going abroad and then the summer internship in the second year. When evaluating the program, we found that it has really done an amazing job to, to get students to breaking the ice and to getting students excited about going abroad. Many of, uh, many of the participants who had not yet had the chance to go abroad um, and, were, and were also first-generation college students and therefore a little bit more risk-averse when it comes to um, international education. So we found that all of them said, when surveyed in the, at the end of the program, wanted to travel more internationally. Um, that the majority of them wanted to pursue an internship abroad, whether in Germany or in another country, um, and 94% wanted to study abroad as, as a result of this experience, which we found remarkable. Um, also in terms of language acquisition, we found that the majority wanted to learn another language, some of them German, some other languages. and. Um, Another aspect we found is also that it that this can help retain students in STEM. So having exposed them to the opportunities, to the research um, fields, to the career opportunities that are available to them if they stay in STEM and pursue a graduate degree in STEM, um, that this has been one of the program outcomes too. So that retaining students in STEM and getting them excited about pursuing um, a graduate degree and maybe um, a higher university degree in, in the sciences as well, um, as well as studying abroad. So with that, I think we will dive into the questions. Yes, and it looks like we have um, a few good questions. Um, there, so there uh, was a discussion earlier about um, integrating uh, the curriculum into students' plans for uh, their undergraduate career, and we had a question that asked, um, have you found the need to include the registrar staff in the discussion um, in addition to the department chairs who might be offering credit in the STEM disciplines? Is uh, and if you have been able to connect, and I guess Haji, this question is for you. Um, how how have you approached that relationship with the registrar's office? Sure. Yeah. Actually, the registrar and and our office, we are very good friends <laughs> because we have to involve them in pretty much every conversation. Um, so we have 
very early on uh, forged a, a very good relationship with the registrar's office and fortunately our registrar really gets it and understands that um, study abroad means making exceptions to the rule in many cases. Um, so definitely uh, we've gotten support from the registrar, but I would say before we even bring things to the registrar, we absolutely are working with the department chairs in on every level. So if a program initiative is, is presented or proposed to us, we usually start by opening the conversation with the department chair to make sure that all of the courses will be vetted and approved. And at Drexel, students on any Drexel program are earning Drexel credit, um, and oftentimes they're getting grades for those courses. So we, we need to make sure that um, the department chair is vetting every single course, and um, that means getting syllabi from our partners, et cetera, to make sure that students can feel very confident and comfortable about what courses they're taking and what credit they will get. And that's that's excellent um, and a really um, I think thoughtful thoughtful response in terms of how collaboration um, can work effectively. Um, and that segues uh, well into the other question that um, we have regarding um, I, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, Haji, in terms of cross training um, staff. But are there ways um, that that we can that you found to better prepare advisors who may not be um, as knowledgeable about STEM majors to, to, to prepare them to have that conversation and perhaps on the flip side of that also then um, preparing faculty to um, talk uh, about study abroad in a way that they don't feel like they have to be experts in, in the field. Yes, definitely. So in terms of cross-training, what we've found is that um, with a variety of different offices that it's not enough to meet with an office or with an advisor and explain things once and expect them to remember it. <laughs> so um, even if, in, in one example, you know, we have some advisors that have been at Drexel for many, many, many years and they know the study abroad programs inside and out. They know every course. They know, you know, they know it like the back of their hand. And then we have many, I would say the majority of advisors who are supportive and if we meet with them and we explain things through that they understand it but they have so much on their plate often um, kind of over overloaded with many other things and so they don't always remember all the details so we do ongoing training for our academic advisors we've done it um, for many years now we have an annual advisor forum and then we will also meet with advisors within each college on a pretty regular basis to just remind them and also keep in mind that there's always turnover so we're training new people as well. Um, in terms of faculty, what we usually do with faculty, unless they're directly involved in the program where they would know the details, is the messaging is really just to direct questions to our office. The main job of the faculty is to help students understand why they should do it and what you know why it's a good idea from an engineering perspective or from a, a biology perspective, why they see the value in it, but really not getting into the details of curriculum coursework because nine times out of ten they will get it wrong if they try to explain all those things. So um, we, our hope is always that when meeting with faculty, we do the workshops quarterly, um, the faculty forum workshops, and we also again, on an ongoing basis, meet with the faculty at their departmental meetings, at the program director meetings, at the faculty resource fairs. It's a constant, never-ending messaging that has to happen because, again, with so many things going on, we can't expect that to be the forefront of their mind at all times. So really, it's just um, being consistent and relentless in, in providing that information and answering questions when needed. Excellent. And, and this is a question for both of you in the work that you've been doing with, with your groups. Have you found that there is a difference in rep representation even within the majors for STEM students who are going abroad? Are there um, maybe programs or departments that's, that are more involved in, in the study abroad process, so for example, engineering versus math students? Um, and and what might be some of the ways that you found to um, to work with all of the differences even within the STEM field? Sure, Katia, do you have any thoughts or um, you share as well? Sure. So within the the groups that are going abroad, we found that it's um, 
that UG Biology and Math majors are, um, are less likely to apply for an internship program. And with math students, it's, it's sometimes can be a little bit tricky depending on their on their fields. Um, it's it's usually it's very easy to find uh, internship positions for engineers. There are plenty out there, um, and for physics majors as well. But for math, it depends on the areas that they're like that they are specializing in. So if they specialize in financial mathematics, it's um, the opportunities. But we found it. But it seems, and there are plenty of opportunities for, for math students and for biology students to do internships overseas. Um, however, it's, it's usually, they usually need a little bit more support in terms of phrasing their, or framing their, their profile um, to make it attractive for a foreign employer and making sure, or convincing a foreign employer um, of the value that they would bring as an American math major um, to, to the group. So we, um, for our experience has been that we work really closely with them on the application materials and on really framing their, um, or sharing their, their profile in a way that um, they can apply their knowledge um, for uh, overseas. Yeah, and I would say at Drexel um, that the, the participation kind of mirrors the size of the program. So within the engineering college, we have the most number of students studying abroad in the largest majors within the college. Um, but outside of that, I would say our lowest participation, like Katya said, is, is math, physics, you know, the hard sciences. And so we look at other ways to engage them since they tend to not be as interested in study abroad programs. We look at research opportunities um, and co-ops as well. So part of it is just the size of the program and we do find it harder to develop programs that are customized for very small disciplines. In some cases there just aren't enough students actually in the discipline to sustain a program and in those cases we look to see are there any other departments that we could possibly combine or collaborate and create an interdisciplinary opportunity for them so that that way the smaller program, the students in the smaller program aren't left out just because of the fact they've chosen to be in a, a smaller program. Excellent. Ahaji, you mentioned a little bit about um, including the language component with um, with the the programming that you're that you're doing with your students. Um, how how can have you found that there have been ways to make the language courses more STEM friendly, um, similar to some of the ways that business has uh, the some of the business programs have have made um, their language courses a little bit more business friendly. I would say, unfortunately, on campus, not so much because there isn't enough, um, there aren't enough STEM students in those languages to, to justify running, you know, sp specialized language courses for them. However, on the programs abroad, for example, um, our program in Costa Rica that is specialized for students in health professions, the Spanish course that they take and the program also has a Spanish prerequisite, so they're required to take Spanish on campus, three terms of Spanish before they go, and then the Spanish course that they take on site is for medical and health professions. So when we're able to offer a customized language course, it usually is on site through our partner. Um, on campus, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Hopefully we will. It's a supply and demand type of thing. And we had a question about faculty buy-in, and I think um, uh, you all, you, both of you, uh, covered some really good strategies for developing faculty buy-in. Even with the the question um, that we had, it, it, there is also a question about incentives. So, how in in for for many of the younger professors who might not be tenured at this point, um, have either of you found um, ways to to work with faculty members who who might be deterred um, from participating in an inter international opportunity when um, they have the other considerations of tenure as they're as, uh, weighing on them? I've found that that depends a lot on the college, that certain colleges at Drexel are, um, are more supportive of pre-tenure faculty being involved in global than others and place more value on it. So, for example, our College of um, Media Arts and Design, the faculty within that college, well, first of all, the college overall is has one of the highest percentages of study abroad at Drexel uh, is coming from the, our Media and Arts Design College. So we have a lot of faculty engagement already. And as a result, or maybe because of the dean's support, 
um, international engagement is definitely looked at as a positive for pre-tenure faculty. That is not the case for all of the colleges. So that's something, I mean, I would imagine that it is a deterrent for faculty, um, pre-tenured pre faculty, but that said, we definitely have seen pre-tenured faculty doing faculty-led programs. So I, I don't have really a, a, a clear-cut answer for that, except that it, there's no university-wide um, policy or, or approach to it, it really is a departmental or college level um, situation. And maybe just to add to that, um, I know that Spelman College, um, as another example, that they are actually involving um, or they're making internationalization um, efforts as part of the uh, faculty tenure review process. So faculty are actively encouraged to, to, to participate in internationalization strategies on campus and initiatives on campus. Um, and that actually counts towards their, their tenure, so, um, which I think is a smart way to, to incentivize it as an institution, institution-wide. Um, and they also give out um, an award for, um, for internationalization, internationalization efforts um, part of the faculty. But I think it's a, it's a wonderful solution that they make it actually part of the, part of the tenure review so that it becomes a no-brainer that they have to be part of their um, review process is that they have to be involved in, in study abroad or um, education abroad initiatives. That's excellent. Very <laughs> forward thinking um, in that in that way. Great, um, Katja. I think this this question um, might be uh, good to hear uh, your thoughts on it since you've had work working with foundations. Um, how were you able to engage funders and um, in a way that that was uh, that was mutually beneficial for all of the different partners that were involved? I know you mentioned the the Hale Foundation. Um, in your one example, perhaps you can give us some some points on um, engaging even in the grant writing process for for getting some additional funding for for STEM students. Yes, absolutely. So the Hall Foundation was um, was unique in a way that we had an existing relationship with the foundation, and we um, were able to win them for this project in particular. Um, um, we convinced them of the value and of the um, of the lack of this type of programming for STEM students um, in, at HBCUs in particular. Um, but we had an existing relationship, and I think that's what usually makes the difference. Um, from our experience, it, um, when it comes to foundations, um, it really depends on their their grant making portfolio. If they have a focus on STEM, they're more likely to um, to to um, fund such initiatives. Um, but there's, I think, a, a lot of I think a lot of funds are untapped. Um, by corporate sponsors as well. So, and we found that when looking for corporate sponsors, um, maybe colleges or universities that have that are in a location where there are um, corp corp companies that might have an interest in um, in investing in in such initiatives to then um, to then recruit graduates potentially as their um, as their future employees. Um, usually, for co company for corporations, it's um, they have their they fund local and local schools more than than out of state schools, so they usually have a local or regional focus in terms of fund, funding. Um, and aside from that, um, I think, and I think I just lost my train of thought. I want to say something else, uh, but I, it just slipped my mind. Um, but there's definitely lots of lots of funding out there, lots of funding available, and I would really look at um, at what existing partnerships there are. Um, and what what kind of companies are um, in the in the area that might have an interest in, in supporting a local school um, and mobilizing students, um, and then also another um, yes it came back to me. Um, so in terms of usually when um, the country country com companies from um, another country that have a that have their headquarters here in the U.S. Um, are also more interested in um, getting students to their country of origin. So in Germany is one example. Um, there are a number of German companies in the U.S. Um, and they are more likely to fund initiatives that will bring students to Germany. Um, that said, they are, and this can be true. It's not just true for Germany, but for for a lot of other countries too. So I would look at what kind of what foreign countries uh, companies are um, have headquarters or offices here and and get in touch with them and seeing um, if they might be interested in in sponsoring such an initiative. And usually, that the um, the m amount of the grant is not for companies is not a big, big investment. It's definitely doable, and it's um, it might be within their it might be aligned with their interests, but it ha would have to be aligned with their um, corporate interests as well. Great. We have also just a a question maybe from your your all's experience. Um, 
uh, Katja, you mentioned it just a, a little bit in terms of one of your programs as a shorter term program. Do you both, do either of you find that more STEM students are interested in the short term versus the longer term programs? Um, or is there uh, some differences even within the, the types of students that you're serving um, that might have a, a, a an interest in, in some of the longer term programs? I know that that's an eternal question for um, this, the education abroad folks and how to get uh, students on different types of, of programs. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Sorry. I, um, so we, we found that, that um, short-term programs are definitely the, the um, number one choice for STEM students. Um, and by short-term, we mean either very, very short-term, like two weeks or less, or um, then summer programs or summer internship programs uh, that will range between eight and 12 weeks in the summer. That's most doable for, for, for students in the sciences. Um, for humanities students, um, they usually go for longer, at least a year. We we have found though that um, if they're considering if STEM students are considering doing a gap year, um, or if they don't have, take the time to go abroad during, before they graduate, um, they are then able to to um, stay up to a year abroad. But that's a smaller number in, in STEM. Yeah, and I would say um, at Drexel, it's well for engineering, for example, um, like the the graphic that I had showed, we had over the past six years. Uh, about 60% of students in engineering on term-long programs and then about 40% on short-term um, intercessions. And Drexel is somewhat strange in that we, our students don't actually have summer vacations. Um, so one of the issues that we have to deal with in any conversation around study abroad is when students will go because they only get a week to two weeks off in between each quarter and they are in session 12 months out of the year either on on co-op or in class so for us the short term when we talk about short term we talk about 7 to 14 days maximum um, and so for us these intensive courses um, have been really critical in opening access, not just for STEM students, but for all the whole university. Um, and what we're seeing is that these short-term programs, which often include an on-campus component, either before or after, um, are, it's just really opening the doorway and it's actually helping us to get more students on the term long program or co-op abroad or research abroad or something like that. But even still, interestingly enough, our numbers show that even though the short-term programs are increasing our overall participation pretty dramatically, our numbers are still about overall half, I would say, students are still doing term long programs. Um, so the increase is happening on both ends. In other words, we're getting more involvement and more access with the short programs, but we're also getting a, an increase in our term long uh, participants as well. This is great. I, um, I know that I am excited about um, so much of the of the good work that both of you are doing. I think you all have been able to provide us some really strong information and resources that we can take back with us to the different institutions um, to think through some ideas of, of how to build faculty buy-in, of how to develop incentives for both um, professionals, faculty, and, and students on campus, as well as developing um, clear and strategic partnerships, um, as you've both outlined. Um, I did want to uh, end our webinar with some uh, contact information for both Ahaji and, and Katya and um, uh, convey a deep and, and grateful appreciation for the time and effort that both Ahaji and Katya have been able to put into this presentation. I think um, we are definitely leaving with some additional comments um, and food for thought um, in the field. And just so that everybody is aware, we even have some of the conversation going on Twitter. So we are excited to, oh, <laughs> to, to continue on um, with this. And um, Ahaji and Katja, thank you so much for your time and effort. And we look forward to continuing the conversation um, with this and other topics um, in the future. Um, are there any uh, last uh, comments that either of you would like to, to provide? Actually, I do have one comment. It's it's just a random thought that I, I wanted to share um, with everyone because it's something that we implemented a couple years ago that's been very helpful as far as 
students and affordability, um, just to put it out there, we have worked with our financial aid office to allow students to actually use their federal work study money um, for study abroad while they're abroad. So we've created a few positions that students can actually do while they're abroad and earn their federal work study money. Um, so it's just kind of a random idea just to put it out there because it's it's meant um, it, it's been highly successful for our office in terms of just giving students that extra little bit of access to money um, by working with the financial aid office. So that's my final my, my final thought for the day. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have any final comments, but I just want to thank you, Lily, for hosting the webinar and for inviting us today. Thank you so much. Excellent. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share and to have this conversation. Definitely. And we do look forward to continuing the conversation. We will make this recording available afterward and uh, we'll certainly keep in touch and update.